Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carolina Gutierrez, and I am new to WICSAP. I've only been uh, working for the coalition for a few months. Uh, we also have here today uh, Michelle dixon wong my co-worker. Um, she will be assisting us um, in the technology and other things as they come. Uh, I want to say thank you to our presenters today uh, for uh, bringing the topic of trauma responses when doing support group. Uh, we have Lori and Kai from YWCA in Clark County. And I will let you both introduce yourselves and share with us your experience doing this. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, welcome. Um, my name is Kay and I'm, uh, like she said, at YWCA Clark County. Um, I'm the program specialist and I've been with the Y around 15 years or so. Um, support groups are one of my favorite things to do, but also one of my favorite things to train on. Um, and I love working with other facilitators and meeting them and um, learning from them and the, the new ideas that they come up with all the time. And um, I am training with my favorite co-facilitator co -facilitator today, uh, Lori. Hello all, thank you so much for being here. My name is Lori Schott and I am the director of the sexual assault program at YWCA Clark County. And I've been doing support groups for quite a few years. When I first started, I learned by sitting in on a group and then sort of the next one was just here, now you take it. And I was terrified and felt very unprepared. And um, so was really grateful for the WICSAP training we went through years and years ago and other ones we've both taken and also given because as Kay said, we learn a lot from folks that participate in these. I heard a great quote from someone yesterday. I believe it was Chris Stark who said it, but no one knows everything, but together we know a lot. So I really recognize that each one of you brings a great deal of information to this work as well. And I hope that if you're a new advocate or new to support groups or a seasoned one that you will leave with some useful information and also just with a, um, a greater confidence in the skill that you have. This is, this is using all the advocacy that you have in just a little bit different fashion. So um, welcome. And I'd like to start um, just by acknowledging the, the original people of the land where Kay and I are right now. So YWCA Clark County acknowledges the land which we occupy and the original people who cared for this land. We would like to acknowledge that our organization and the areas we frequent are on the traditional lands of the Cowlitz, Multnomah, Clackamas, Malala, Kalapaya, Tualatin, and Kathlamic people. And that this land was unwillingly given by the original occupants of this land. And if you haven't already, I would just encourage you to pause and take a moment and thank, um, thank the original occupants of whatever land you're on, wherever you are, and those who have stewarded it for all these years. So today our main goal is that you all will gain confidence in navigating some trauma responses within a group setting. Pretty simple. And we hope to do that by with the objectives that um, identifying some trauma responses that may present during group sessions. We'll discuss trauma-informed intake processes and guideline creations. We'll share ways of safely navigating trauma responses during group sessions and then learn and have fun on Zoom together. And the reason we pick these, if it seems um, we're really, Wixap shared with us some feedback of what people wanted more information on. So we were trying to compile it in a way that made sense and hopefully, again, will be useful for you all. So I was gonna say, sound good? And I will do my best to monitor the chat. Um, I am not the strongest multitasker, so I'm gonna be watching a lot. If there's something that I've missed, I know we've got Carolina here who is um, great. And thank you for the support. So I'll turn it over to Kate. All right, so um, 
when we, when, I recently went through the WICSAP core training and I learned some cool new things. And so um, Lori and I thought we would try them today, a couple of them that I was really excited about. Um, so thank you, Michelle, that, those are new to me and I've been playing with them ever since. Um, you know about chat, so uh, feel free to put stuff in the chat box, we're monitoring it and we'll um, try to answer some of your questions as we go along, along. and then at the end, we'll also have some time for questions. Um, but the couple things we'd like to, to learn that were new to me, and maybe they're not new to you, but I had a lot of fun with them, are text and stamp. So I'm gonna go to the next slide and try to show you here. So this is a picture of the, if you just look at the top one right now, um, you see there's a place where it tells um, whose screen you're viewing. And then there's view options. And if you drop down, there's a little thing annotate. So if everybody can click on annotate. And then you have some choices down there. And the first one we want to do is this little one here that's text. So if you click on text, um, then you click on the slide and it'll, open a text box. Maybe Lori and Michelle, if you can do this as we're doing it, they'll start seeing it. I don't know. Oh, Lori. Lori's happy. Yeah. Usually she writes. <laughs> Sometimes she writes funny things. Um, so yeah. So you can just, there we go. Awesome. Yeah. The text box appears. You type in the text box and then just click somewhere outside the text box. Um, and that's how you do text. And we're going to use that in a minute. And I noticed too, someone has said annotate is not an option on a Chromebook. So if you no. want to, I know, I'm so sorry. That was um, yeah, something not as accessible there, but I'm thank sorry. you for letting us know and feel free to write it on the um, chat then. And I will do my yes, best to for sure. see those answers. That is a good thing to learn today. Darn Chromebook. I mean, not, oh, 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 hold on. I get excited. Okay. Uh, the next thing is stamp. So again, you can see right here, so you're in annotate and then stamp, and then it'll give you a choice of four or five little icons. Oh, there's the heart. And all you have to do is click on them and then Lori, Lori likes to make, yeah, arrows, heart, they're everywhere. So we're gonna try this in a couple minutes. Um, but you basically click where you want your stamp to go. All right. And I am going to try to clear all these. Oh, I remember. Okay. All right, Lori, I think you can okay. do this. I can't forward my screen until I get out of that, I found. Okay. Oh, I see. I promise. So, I'll give you a chance to practice. And again, my deep apologies for those that are limited to the chat room there. Um, but just getting a little gauge of how you're feeling this afternoon, if you're willing to practice on that annotate and can either type it in the chat or put it on the, the screen. A little tired, sleepy. Let's see here. <laughs> <laughs> Busy, Tired. overwhelmed. Tired. <laughs> <laughs> He's not even caffeinated. So I know I'm not. Uh, it need to be apparently. We're back. And energized. Energized and let's see, uh, normally I have annotate, but don't today. Okay, so missing out on annotate too. All right. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. And I, I, what I also hear is a lot of the busy, the overwhelm, and um, tired. So I especially appreciate your time being here for this. And I hope, I hope this also feels um, nurturing that you leave with something of like, okay, I'm reminded again of how important my work is, and what a difference you make in survivors' lives. So let's try, we'll do one more. Um, we did not do the polls. We're gonna just try this as a uh, 
different type of poll, taking a pulse on the experience. So if you can do the stamp, the annotate stamp feature, the upper left, the blue one that says, I am an experience facilitator. The upper right in the purple one says, I have some experience facilitating. And then the green in the middle says, I have no group facilitation experience yet. If you don't mind, if you're able to, just to use your annotate button and stamp whichever one is applicable for you. Some experience, in fact, I'll do that. I'll use the annotate and click on the ones in the, in the box. So, whoops, I did the wrong one there, okay. Okay, so. Some experience, green bubble, some. no experience, some experience. Experience facilitator. I like this stamp because it helps me transpose what I'm reading in the chat box very quickly. So, so it looks like some experienced facilitators. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. So it looks like it's um, kind of a, some balance between some experienced and just some folks with just some, I think that one dot there was me still learning the uh, stamp feature. So. Um, <laughs> I do too. <laughs> I, just, I just always want to throw in a different answer. So everyone is included here. So we will do, and this is just one more pulse and I promise this is. And we're a, done with this. Yeah. Um, so again, the feedback that we got from Wixap of things that were People said, I'm not sure how to deal with this and some different things. So, so some of the ones that came up were anger, guilt or low self-esteem, fear and anxiety, and dissociating or kind of checking out. And when you think about what, if you're looking at these, is there one that, and you can just stamp on it, of um, which one feels sort of the most challenging for you? And if none of them do and you want to just stamp up in the upper right, you're welcome to do that. But if there's um, the one that's like, gosh, I just feel less able to deal with it. And I'll do the clicks for uh, anger. Should have done a little different stamp there. Anger. 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 And then an extra, someone said the anger, particularly when it results in lashing out at other group members. Okay. So it sounds like that one's really uh, the, the key one here. Okay. So we will, let me I'll let you erase that stuff, Kay. And then also, um, the anger, the lashing out, and low self-esteem that results in derailing in a major way, if that makes sense. Yes, it does make sense. Um, okay, so do you want to go to the next slide, Kay, please? Yeah. And this one I want us to have on for a minute because I thought after you're looking at those pictures of, you know, anger and dissociation stuff, something to sort of, for me, that seems calmingly, uh, uh, anyway, I liked it. So. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Kay. Yeah, so um, we're going to talk about how to navigate those four trauma responses um, in particular and um, how to deal with them in the moment because we, we've all probably navigated them lots of times in individual advocacy. I think the part that gets challenging or puts, puts a little fear in us is if it's going to pop up in the middle of group because you're also trying to take care of or you know keep the group a safe place for everyone and then you've got um, something going on here in the, and it's a completely different feeling when um, you're trying to advocate for an individual within a group and you're also really the advocate for the whole group at the same time um, a couple things i want to say up front one is it really, really helps if you can do it, if you have a co-facilitator. 
Um, I know um, we, I've had experiences where it would have been really difficult to navigate it if I'd been in the room alone, and I'll share one of those in a bit when it pops up. But, and I know some programs just don't have the capacity, but um, we always have a co-facilitator and it really um, is really helpful. If you're trying to advocate or respond to a trauma response with an individual, it can be really helpful to know that there's someone who has your back who's also scanning the rest of the group to see what's going on. And then the other thing is that um, each of these things we're gonna talk about today are big topics all on their own and things that survivors um, generally almost always will encounter at one time or another. And so while today we're talking about how to respond within a support group on the spot, um, for each of these things in our support groups, we have a whole um, session dedicated to that topic. And so um, if we're talking about anger, um, while I might on the spot be saying something, I'm also going to say, and in week five, we're going to really delve into anger and talk more about it um, because it's such an issue um, that comes up and, and um, people want to talk about that and it's really important. So those two things, um, I think it's important to have these things, bigger conversations within your curriculum. And if you can have a co-facilitator, sometimes it makes all the difference. So um, we're going to go to the next slide. Oh, we're going to talk about anger. So um, when you're thinking about a group setting, how might anger show up in that setting? How might an individual express that? Or how might you notice that that's what's going on? And you can just do the chat or text or anything you want. Elevated voice and aggressive body language um, as a form of grief when processing experience, swearing, raised voice, body language, be snarky comments to other people. Yeah, yeah those are all really good. Um, yeah, it can show up lots and lots of different ways. And sometimes um, it might be at um, the offender, it might be at the system, it might be at, occasionally it might be at another group member and that, that's a little dicier to handle, but um, we're mostly talking, I guess, about general anger coming up, although I, I'm going to share a little bit about when it was against another group member and why I was so glad I had another facilitator. And I also wanted to add to someone that included interrupting others frequently. So Yeah, cool. All right. So ways that we can navigate this. Um, sorry. First thing is, and, and you're going to hear the, uh, some of these over and over because they're just really important to just acknowledge it. Acknowledge it's in the room. Um, I, there's a lot of anger in the room today. You know, I, um, there are a lot of big feelings in the room today. And you don't have to point a person out. You can just say, you know, acknowledge that the anger is there. And, um, along with acknowledging it is to validate and, nor validate and normalize it. Because anger is a really normal response. It's this response you would expect to, to being sexually assaulted and violated and having your power taken away. Um, but it's a thing that seems to scare survivors a lot um, because sometimes they haven't felt that, that level of anger before this or um, they don't you know, they don't feel in control of it. There can be a lot of issues around it, which is why we spend a whole session on it. But just validating and normalizing it um, can really be helpful. And then we try to, you know, shift gears a little bit. So um, this is where you can, your redirecting can be really useful, where you can say, um, I hear there's just a lot of anger that's been expressed here. There's a lot of frustration um, and, I went, you know, are we ready to move on to the day's topic? And maybe one way to do that might to be do some grounding together or a little bit of breathing together. Um, and you have to time it properly and make sure people feel heard. 
but this is one way you can transition into the next thing. Um, so that's kind of if the anger is generalized and sometimes anger is almost a bonding thing too. If um, somebody is really upset with the way the criminal justice system is, is treating them or they feel treated. Other people may chime in on that. That can be a, a way that people connect, oddly enough. And, um, but again, you want to be able to bring it back to the topic at hand and also say, we're going to explore anger more. And these are really normal feelings. These are really, um, your feelings are important. You're entitled to them, all those things. Um, the one time I had a person in group who um, really got really, really angry at another group member and it just escalated so fast, um, just shockingly fast. And all of a sudden she was at a 12 and, and screaming and um, ended up running out of the room. So I did have a co-facilitator that I'd worked with a lot, fortunately. And so um, I stepped, I followed her out of the room to make sure she was safe and see. She was so fast, I never caught her until, you know, we checked in later. Um, but group was almost over. It was like two minutes until the next group was going to be coming through the door. And so um, the facilitator and I, in about a minute conversation, agreed she, she would stay in the room with the participants because they were very shaken up. And it was clearly um, that level of anger and um, emotion in the room had really, really undone them. And so she sat with them and went through some grounding and some breathing and did some things. And I stood outside and made sure the next group waited because the last thing they needed was more people walking in on them after this or not knowing who was coming through the door or what was going to happen next. And so she was able to spend time with them to sort of um, bring that back into a, a safe space before they, so that people didn't leave with that on their, you know, carry that out of the room. Um, Cause I don't, I think a lot of them would not have come back. So um, that's the only time I've ever experienced where the anger was directed at another person that way and, and went, so, it just went so quickly. I didn't, I, I was blindsided. Um, and I, and if I'd only been the only person there, I'm not quite sure I could have managed it, but it would have been um, very tricky. Kay, do you wanna, is now a good time to do the breathing one? Um, or are you gonna do that later on? I'll do it later. Yeah. Okay. Well, wait a minute. Um, oh, it's after fear, because it's a scary picture, remember? <laughs> so how about fear? That was another one that popped up for people. How might that show up in a um, group setting? You're welcome to withdrawn and quiet. Okay. Yeah, I had a woman whose face I didn't see for five weeks once. Uh, she'd wear a hoodie and kept it completely closed over her face. Um, and in about the sixth week, she was able to um, come out a little bit so that we could see her. We also have closed off body language and constant looking around the room. And nervous chatter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good. And it so might also be not showing up. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Kay. I know. But yeah, for sure. It's not even showing up. Um, yeah, so again, acknowledging it because fear is, um, is the obvious and appropriate response to being assaulted, to, you know, being sexually assaulted. And um, we know with the things that they've discovered with brain science and all that, that the fear doesn't go away just because the assault might be over, um, that you carry it with you somewhat, but survivors um, can know they're in a physically safe place, but not feel safe. And um, so we know that, that fear is a normal, um, and again, validating and normalizing, it's a normal and expected response. Um, again, it's something that, you know, in week six, we're going to spend more time delving into fear and some tools for dealing with it. You know, you, you can talk about that stuff. 
Um, because again, you don't want to just say, oh yeah, it's normal. And then, but we don't really know what to tell you to do about it. Um, but in the moment, um, if, if a lot of fears are coming up, really normalizing that. Um, you can also look at the space. So when we actually were in a room together, um, one of the things we realized after a while was that there, was, there were two doors. And one was the entrance to get into the room. And the other one actually went into a closet. But it wasn't until I'd done a few groups that one of the members finally said, what, what's, where does that door go? And I realized that that could be really scary, wondering if someone was going to come through the door or if someone was on the other side of the door. And so, you know, then it was easy to say, oh, it's a closet. Um, the way in and out of this room is this one door and there's no one in there. We just store paper and stuff like that in there. Um, the other thing we got used to doing was figuring out if people wanted the, the blinds open or shut because some people that fishbowl especially at night can be really um, not feel safe to them because they can feel like people can see in and we can't see out. Um, or sometimes even during the day, they would prefer to have that shut. And so we got used to, to offering to do that, to lower the lights, to do whatever. We looked at the art in our group room and we had, um, you know, to most people it was fine, but there was one of, one of the people on staff that said, I've always hated that picture. It looks really violent to me. And I, actually never thought about it, but when we sort of looked at that, so we took it down and we put up really neutral, um, really um, positive things on the walls that were unquestionably positive. Um, and then also in your virtual space, you know, if um, you have something scary on the wall behind you, or if you're a horror fan and you have, you know, the, the carry poster, well, that's really old, but something behind you that looks terrifying. That could be something. Um, thinking about your virtual space and what that looks like. Um, and you can ask them if there are things that would make the room safer for them um, and individuals. And they may have some ideas about that too and things you haven't thought about. And then again, the grounding and breathing. Um, and we're going to bring this up almost every time because it, it can really help. Um, it's just a good way to shift the energy in a room. It's a good way to keep modeling it. If you're doing it every week, um, that can really be helpful when someone is in a situation and they're alone and they can draw on that and they've practiced it. Um, and the one we were going to do that Lori was asking about, we made these um, frames and we made them, so I'm going to hold it up. I don't know how well you guys can see it, but it says breathe up here and it says breathe down here. So the way we use these and all we did was buy some blank mats to do this and then people decorated them. So the way we do this, it, it looks funny on Zoom because it frames me, <laughs> it's normally. So one person can have it or everyone can have their own. And if, if I were in a group, it would be facing me so I could see the pretty artwork if, it, if I had my own. Some people put pictures of their kids on them or animals. Some people put words. People decorated them with things that they find soothing um, and, and that makes them feel good. So the way we do this, if you want to do it with me, is we're going to take a deep breath and hold it for a second. So everybody breathe in like. And then as I turn it, we're going to exhale. And then breathe in. And then exhale. And you can do that a few times. And it's just a tool. Uh, it can be a fun activity for people to do in group to make their own. And more than anything, having it hang on the wall behind you is just a reminder. Or, you know, hang it in the wall in front of you. It's just a reminder that, yeah, that's a good thing to do every now and then to stop and, and just breathe. Because I think we really underestimate the power of breathing. Um, and then the next one we talk about is dissociate. <laughs> I had a tooth pulled yesterday and I, my tongue feels huge to me, <laughs> but um, disassociation and difficulty concentrating. And um, so if you want to put in some, how do you think this might show up? How it might look as people are 
dissociating disassociating. Yeah. And I didn't want to ignore the one Mia wrote um, with the Zoom, one may show up for fear is um, turning it off partway through so we can talk about that. So ways that dissociation might show up is zoned out or distracted, inability to contribute in group, daydreaming, asking what the question or the topic being discussed is once the conversation has been going on for a little bit, you bet, trailing off halfway through sharing, checking phone continuously, yeah, it sounds like you guys have had some experience with this. Yeah, random really topic good. changes. Yeah, uh, uh, just staring or fidgeting, um, eyes closed, head down. Yeah. Um, one of the th one of the things about this that I like to think about is that um, dissociation and difficulty concentrating are coping mechanisms that people use. And they're usually, I mean, they aren't always uncomfortable with that. But oftentimes they've been doing that for a while and that's how, they, that's how they operate in the world and they're comfortable with it. So when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking it might be more about my discomfort with it because I'm thinking, are they not hearing what I'm saying? Are they missing the information? Am I boring them? You know, it might be more about my insecurity as a facilitator than it really is about this trauma response. Um, and so I think that that's really good to realize that this is a coping mechanism and it's, um, it's not about me necessarily. And the other thing I like to be, I think it's really important to do is um, whatever topic you're doing that day to also send it home in written form. And if, if I'm a person who dissociates or I know I'm gonna have trouble concentrating or it's really not a good day for me, having that in my hand that I know I'll be able to look at when I get home know that I'm really not, you know, if I'm not able to concentrate now, I'm not going to miss out on that information because it might be really important to me, um, it can be really helpful. So it's, it's really good to be able to um, have things in written form and have the other things, the discussion and activities. And it also helps with different learning styles and ways that people take in information. Um, but again, acknowledging it, um, Sometimes it's painful or difficult to talk about our trauma. Our brains might even cho choose to help us dissociate from it. And again, what, the more we learn about brain science, um, the more that we understand how these things are operating um, by choice and not by choice sometimes. But it's a really, really normal response that we're seeing a lot of. Um, and it's, it's a way to cope. Um, stretch breaks. So um, sometimes it can be good just to stand up and stomp your feet or just reach or um, just shift the room physically. A lot of, a lot of things, um, it's just a matter of making a transition. So shifting around a little bit can be really helpful to people. Or if, the, I mean, these can really help if the whole group is starting to feel like they're fading a little bit. It can be like, let's just Get up and, and, and reach for the ceiling. Now there's Lori demonstrating for you. And then again, the grounding and breathing can help. Um, you know, you can say uh, right now grounding might be helpful in helping us come back into the room because we as advocates know that grounding is about coming back to a place, not leaving. And so being able to do some grounding with them can be really helpful. All right. And then we have guilt and low self-esteem and how those might show up. Yeah, how do you all think those might look or how that may present with participants in your group? You can just write in the chat. So self-hate and blame for what happened to them. Yep. Blaming self for abuse. Apologizing constantly. Could be soft-spoken or no eye contact. That, and it can look like a person making a lot of self-deprecating or self-defeating comments. I bet these are all great. Only building up other participants and not themselves. 
anxious about? Volunteering frequently. Yeah, so one of the things, um, you know, we think about it as people not participating, but sometimes over participation or um, monopolizing a conversation. Um, sometimes that happens because people don't feel heard or haven't felt heard and all of a sudden people are listening. Um, And that reiterating of yes on the monopolizing, that's a hard one. Um, yeah, redirecting is really helpful in that. Um, we can talk a little bit about um, redirecting in a respectful way that isn't, um, doesn't make the person feel worse. <laughs> you know? And one of the things I like to do if um, someone is, I wait, if someone is, is really, you know, we need to redirect and move on. I'll wait until I hear them say something, um, something significant or, or that I can jump on. And then I'll say, I want to stop you there because that's a really, really good point. Um, you're right, da, 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 da. And it has to be real. I, I, you know, it has to be something I'm, I'm genuine about. Um, and then I'm able usually to sort of transition into what do other people think about this or something like that. Um, but that's worked for me a few times. Um, because it's a way you can really interrupt a person, but you're interrupting them for a good to say, that's such a good idea, you know, rather than stop talking, which we would never do. Yeah, those are great. Um, so, again, um, acknowledging seeing a pattern uh, here. That's why. Validate, neuralize, yeah. But in this one, um, reframing is also really helpful. So if a person in the group says something like, you know, I'm a loser, I should be over this by now. Um, I thought I was healing, but you know, I'm using again, whatever the, this, this stuff is. I think, um, you know, I mean, you can say, I don't see a loser here. I see a woman who shows up every week to work on her healing. Um, and you can include the group of that too. Lori, Lori was talking to me about, you know, you can say, I don't see any losers here. I see people, women who are showing up every week to do really, really hard work. And again, I think the key to it is to be specific and it has to be genuine. If it's not something that you truly believe, um, you know, it's not flattery. It's a genuine, it's a genuine um, observation of what you see because you're not going to see losers in the room. You know, you're going to see courageous people. So um, reframing can really help. Also, if you do that, other members are likely to chime in. And the more you model it, ideally, the more they start um, being able to do that for themselves and for their um, for the other members in the group. And I think it's, you know, something I've done with folks before too, is say, if they've said something really definitive, either self-deprecating comment or statement, um, I'd ask first, I'd say, are you, are you open to a, a potentially different view? And if they say no, that's fine too. But, you know, again, getting consent for this and um, offering something, you know, again, whether it's about substance use, I'd say, you know, my experience has been some people wouldn't be alive without that because that helped them sort of shut down and tune out during some really awful things that had happened to them. And if without that, they, they probably wouldn't be alive. It maybe doesn't serve them anymore, but that was, they weren't a bad person for using. They were, that was their coping. Just yesterday in a training, I heard a, something I had never heard before about indigenous belief is that um, with dissociation, that it's time traveling. And I, I'm sorry, I don't have more to offer on that, but I had not heard that. And I thought if someone was really berating themselves for checking out or not being present and like acknowledging that, again, they have incredible coping skills that they're using and, and may just be labeling them as negative traits rather than seeing the strength that it's taken them to get to this point so far. So, so before we uh, move into intakes, do we have any questions in this section we want to address? I don't have my chat up. I've got mine up. And just so you know, we'll be talking sort of about each of those within the 
the rest, but are there any big questions? questions burning questions you want to get to before we move on? All right. Okay. So next we're going to talk about three areas that you can work on some before the intake process and then others during group to help with the response. And it's not about controlling the response. It's about what can we do beforehand and even during that both allows for it, but also still creates that safe space in a group, still maintains um, that people can share and it doesn't become overwhelming for the, the individuals and the group as a whole. And so this will be intakes, the guidelines, and then um, some actual grounding. So with the intakes, let's do another. Yeah, we told you we were done. Um, yeah. Our last I will four. say we, our program always does intakes. Um, these are great for information gathering and for support and all. Safe Choice is the domestic violence program right next to us that we work alongside. They do dropping groups, but they still do intakes. They've started doing that and that's been really helpful for them. So if, I think this is the last stamp poll we have, right? And I will get my annotate so I can um, get my annotate on so I can um, stamp for anyone in the chat. But on the left side, it has, we do support group intakes. And on the right side, it has, we do not do support group intakes. And if you would just mark which one they do. Okay, so it's, okay, and if folks still want to do it, that's fine. I, I know when I'm doing these, I'm a slow typer, so by the time I type something in the chat, I feel like they've moved on, so I hope we don't do that um, to you all. We really do appreciate you being here. So for the most part, folks do. Let's, um, so let's talk about it. Um, because as I said, we found that they're super helpful and they also may really help you feel more prepared. Oh, I didn't, uh, hold on a half second here, I didn't. There we go. Um, feel more prepared and confident in navigating the trauma, space, the trauma responses when they come up. So survivors do not like surprises, right? This is not a, um, the unknown and something unexpected is not generally helpful. And so doing the intakes can really help answer questions and calm fears. When you think about some of these responses that come out of fear, the more information beforehand, the more prepared folks are and the more they can often like, okay, this is scary, but I know what to expect. You'd be amazed at how much that can really help um, either eliminate it altogether or incredible, you know, mitigate the amount of uh, response that comes up for folks. And so the first one we'll do is one is you've got more prepared participants, right? In back in the days when we could meet in real time, which I do hope we get to again, you can show them the space. Can you imagine if you don't know what you're going to and it feels scary enough calling about a group, let alone showing up for a group. If you can meet with someone one on one before and we actually do our intakes in the large group room and we let them know and it's just like here's where we'll be meeting. So when you come in this night, you'll check in at the receptionist. You don't have to sign your name, but you can just put you're here with the SA program. So that, again, they know what to sign in and where they're going to go and they get a chance to see the space. They're more prepared for it. The intakes also let you meet the, you know, let the individuals meet the facilitators, which how nice it is if there's a familiar face, right? Either through Zoom or in person, but oh, I, I know that person. I'm good. I feel like I belong here then. I think about it in our building, we have several different programs and there are trainings and other things going on so when someone comes in, 
we always have one facilitator down by the door and the other that's in the room. And because if someone shows up and then they, are they in the position of saying, uh, where's the room for the sexual assault support group? We don't want to put someone in that position. So we would, the person at the door might say, are you here for the CASA training? And if they look, um, uh, no, they go, great, I'm Lori. We're doing the support group. Is that what you're then perfect? And so it's, it saves them from having to save it out, you know, say it out loud in the lobby. And it also is a way of really um, welcoming them. So I totally went off on a tangent, but meeting the facilitators is, is really important. And as Kay said, you also, you know, if they get to see the space, they can see things that may bring up potential fear. Um, introducing to the virtual platform can also give them, if people are not familiar with it, during the intake, you give them a little time to play with the platform. So they get to know how to um, maybe change their name and if they don't want their full name on there. Oh, I appreciate it. So we do individual intakes before the group meets. Yes, we do. Yeah. And, you know, if they have questions about Zoom, I appreciated someone said that people may shut down, you know, shut off their, the visual on, and that's, you know, how someone might check out. So talking with folks beforehand, and you can even show, you know, how do you mute it? How do you stop the video? And if it feels like that's too uncomfortable, that also may be like, this might not be the right group. You don't want someone in the group that's shut down their video the entire time, because then I think it's hard for the other participants. So the intake will let you know, is this a, is, does this seem like a good fit for them? Which is the next one is it gives a chance to screen participants into more appropriate services if this isn't the right one. When I first started, it felt like there were never um, enough groups or if, if we were starting a group, I wanted to get everyone in there because I thought, well, if we don't have one again for another couple of months or something, I, I just wanted to be sure I got them in there. And um, I've since learned that I don't do that, that I really want to be listening carefully because some of the things that we ask on the intakes give us great information of whether this is the right service for them at this time. And an example would be if the sexual assault happened recently, I wouldn't put them in a group. And part, and I would tell them that, and it's not because of the individual, it's because that's the, our policy within the program. We use the, basically use the guideline of a year after the assault. Now that doesn't mean we check the date and we don't ever make exceptions, but the reason for that is following, immediately following an assault, someone is more focused on safety and, um, you know, like safety planning and just kind of taking care of immediate needs. So to sit and be focused on, you know, the curriculum we have is more about integrating, integrating what this crime has done and, and moving forward from that. So to put someone in a support group after they've been recently assaulted does not feel responsible or respectful for the participant, but it also, again, can be really derailing for the other group members. Another one would be suicide. And we ask about suicide if folks have thought about it or attempted it. And if, if someone has, is in that spot and that's, um, you know, either they've attempted or been thinking about it a lot, I would check in more about, I wanna be responsible and connect them with therapy. Do they have access to that? Maybe they haven't gone because they had a terrible experience early on. So can I help them in support them in finding one that is a good, you know, a trauma-informed therapist that knows about sexual assault. Again, this is not about screening people out of group. It's about really making sure we're getting them connected with the best services possible. I will also say that it can be a real relief. Um, I have met with folks and, you know, perhaps based on some of the stuff in the intake, I've said, you know, it, if now doesn't feel like the right time for a group for you, 
we can always put your name on the list for next time and the next time a group comes up we'll call how would that be and i can all you know i can i've had a couple that have just said oh that'd be great and i think part of it was because they had friends and family that were very loving and well-meaning but that came out as you should be in a group it worked for me you've got to get in a group and so they were doing what they thought they should do but were really not quite ready for that themselves and it was i think a a big relief to give them that freedom to not do that at this time. The next one is the intakes can help you identify potential triggers and trauma responses. So I think about this if if I'm talking with someone and throughout the entire time, again, maybe they've just been talking constantly or they've gotten really escalated and Anger just keeps coming up. It seems like they can't, you know, that's a predominant emotion and what's going on. I think that could be one, again, really tough for a group, but it may be a real barrier for their success in the group. And that's where I would, as we ask about if they're in therapy, asking, you know, if they're not, that may be a more appropriate support at this time. We want them, we want the services to be helpful to them and not re-triggering. They can also tell you, they might tell you um, things that, you know, maybe they'll say, well, yeah, I do this or I just check out or something. And in that one-on-one, -on -one, you can have that conversation and say, are there things that help you come back when you do that? So that then you're prepared as a facilitator, if and when that happens during a group, you're not thinking, oh gosh, they're just checking out. They've They've shared that information and they've given a way to perhaps help them join back in. So there are a lot of good reasons to do it. And then let's go to, so now on them, and I'm more than happy to send with the slides, we'll send the our intake if you want. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's worked for us. And it's also, we've changed it over the years, but thinking about what you ask, why you ask it and how you ask. And one of the things I do, again, I think of back in the days of in-person when I was meeting with someone, I would always show them, I've got my little paper here and I'd show and I'd say, so I'm taking minimal notes and basically it's what you're telling me and I'll read it back to you. So I make very sure I let them know what I'm doing with this information and I will say, this is just for me and the other facilitator. And then after this, you know, whatever it is on week, whatever, or at the end of the group, we shred them. I want to be really clear what I want you to know what we're doing with this information. This just helps us best know how to support in the group. And you can give a choice, obviously, about answering the questions. If there's anything they don't want to answer, they don't have to. And if they give a lot of detail, I might, they may say, you know, I was abused by my dad at six and brother and all this, and then I might say, um, so what I would normally write here is, it sounds like multiple abuses by multiple family members. Does that feel like it, because I don't need to put all the details of their, of their assaults on this form. So thinking about, now I'm gonna put this question out there. Do you mind pulling up the next one, Kay, of what, um, what are some of the things you all ask that, that you feel really give valuable information on your intakes? And you can type it in the chat if you want. And I just realized I'm looking at one that is um, that I have not edited this one yet. We've since taken out, we ask about coping strategies and we have both healthy and unhealthy. And we've since been taking out the healthy and unhealthy of just like not needing that judgment of the term. Again, if people, I feel like that adds to, if someone, you know, their coping mechanism is that they're drinking or they're eating and they say, well, that's an unhealthy one. That's just one more layer of guilt or shame that can be added on. So we're just saying, what are your coping mechanisms? So I'll make sure before we send that to Michelle that we get that edited out. 
Um, so it look, looks like they're asking, what do you hope to get out of group? Oh, thank uh, you. If they've been in supporter therapy groups before and how that experience was for them. A um, couple people are asking what they hope to get out of group. Great. Yeah. And I don't think that's a good one about have you been in ones before and how is that experience? We, I realize we don't have that on ours. So that's thank you. Yeah. 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 We do ask about suicide We say, you know, frequently in a group of this nature, the topic of suicide comes up. Have you ever thought about that or attempted suicide? Uh, we ask about your support networks. What are those? And are you in therapy now? Is it helpful? We ask, is your therapist supportive of your, of your participation in group at this time? Again, that might these can give some great information. Someone might say, well, no, they didn't really think I was ready, but I feel like I have to do this. And then just continuing that conversation of, do you, are you open to telling me more about that? Are there concerns there that, you know, we can address or that may be helpful to know? Um, we ask, are you currently in a relationship? Does this feel safe and supportive? We used to ask a long time ago, like medications, and then realized I, I'm not a doctor. I wouldn't even know what to do with that, to be honest. So we thought a better way to ask is, do you have any medical or mental health issues that the group facilitators should be aware of? So they can then, they don't have to say anything or if they want to, you know, we've learned some, oh, hold on a second here, the, in the chat, let's see, in our county has a history of mandating, strongly encouraging DV survivors to attend support group, especially if involved in a dependency case. So we have a place where we inform them that services are free and confidential and they cannot be required to attend support group. But if they wish to stay, they are more than welcome to. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Some of the things we learned about the, the medical question, people have shared I have nitroglycerin in my purse. I just want you to know if that's, um, or someone might be prone to seizures and they can let us know what, you know, what to either expect or best to support them on it. Um, someone had shared that they have narcolepsy and said, I, I, so it's not that I'm checking out. I would just, could someone give me a gentle pat on the shoulder, to bring me back in. That was super helpful because it would have been easy to just think, oh, here's someone who's, you know, again, just checking out. And we were able to ask, do you, you know, thanks so much for sharing that. Do you want to share that with the group when it starts up? Would you like us to? Is that something you want shared? Because it was, you know, it was really wonderful the way they were able to both state what goes on with them, but also how they wanted to be brought back. And we also ask, is there anything you can think of that would prevent you from coming to group? So, again, it was a childcare, transportation, any other barriers? And maybe they'll even say, I'm just afraid of this. Wow, thanks for sharing that. Are you open to telling me a little bit more? Where, what, is there something you're afraid of? Because if it's transportation or childcare, are there other things that we can take care of? Those are, Great, I'd hate to think someone was trying to navigate barriers that we could help with beforehand. And lastly, we ask, how are you doing after this? You know, you've answered all these questions. Are you doing okay? And that's been such a nice thing. I, Kay and I both have had so many experiences where someone kind of paused and smiles like, oh yeah, I'm doing better than I thought. I was like, this was a big step. So you can see how making the time to do the intake and really um, sharing and getting information from them can be immensely helpful in kind of the, the fear, I think, and some kind of how that can come out as, um, and the anxiety that may come out, normally come out in group because people aren't sure what to expect. And of course, we always ask, can we tell you about the group so you know what to expect? Like, you know, we'll give them the, the calendar of, the weeks and what the topics are those weeks. And again, that no one's required to share. So let's see. 
yes, are you leaving enough time and being prepared for the responses during intake? So it's not just a matter of, let me get your demographics and then we've got you signed up. Really allowing for that. Again, if, if the fear comes out because, you know, there was a sexual assault and on top of it, they're really afraid of group. Can you imagine if, you, if someone's had a way to vent that out kind of beforehand and share that? Like, oh, okay, I, again, I know what to expect. I'm ready to be there. The next one, are you comfortable with the questions? So if, again, we've had folks that say like, oh, I don't really, you know, again, I'm, I'm not used to asking about the sexual assault or sorry, about the um, suicide. What if they say yes? So if there's anything that you're uncomfortable with, talk about it with your co-facilitator or colleagues, practice, just practice that because you are, the more comfortable you are with this, the more normalized it is and the safer someone feels with you as a facilitator. And it just gives a chance, again, I think also the more comfortable you get with it, that carries over into group, into your facilitating within the group. And last but not least is, do you have policies or procedures around screening folks into other services? And as I mentioned, you know, having the one about the year wait, it was so helpful to have that because it shifts it to, this is just our program policy. This has nothing to do with the person. So I don't want to, I don't want to add any shame or anything that says, oh, you're not ready for group. That's not me deciding that. That's just saying what, what we found is the best support for folks is, you know, if they've been recently assaulted, I want to make sure you have, if you're open to having counseling available or advocacy, you know, our 24 hour hotline, but I don't want to put you in a situation in the group. Um, so you can rely and fall back onto your program guidelines and policies and have this at the very end, but I encourage you follow your instincts, trust your gut, right? Um, I mean, we have those, Kay and I both have those examples where it was like, oh, I, I don't know, I want to make it work. Something just didn't, there was a lot that came out in the intake that I just thought, maybe not quite, but I really wanted them to, you know, they said they really wanted group and um, your intuition, you have, you all have a strong intuition, you're empathic people here that you can sit with folks in trauma listen to that too. Um, the times when I've gone against it, I have regretted it. So um, I just want to support you and encourage you to follow that. So, okay, I'm going to turn it. Oh, any questions or comments on that right now? About the intakes? All right. I will turn it to Kay. All right, well, we are, we're almost two thirds of the way. So we're gonna stretch. So um, if you're wearing pants, you can stand up, uh, just stretch, <laughs> stretch in your chair, but let's just take a couple minutes and um, just stretch because we've been sitting here a while. Lori recently got a cat, so now I do cat pictures instead of dog pictures. And I'm not standing up, but I am wearing pants. I just want to clarify. I am yeah, wearing... that's what you say. Okay. All right. Let's see anything on the chat. I'm going to shut my chat off here, Lori. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about guidelines. Um, and again, with looking at the um, through the lens of trauma responses and um, how guidelines interact with those a little bit. Um, so we looked at some guidelines and how we might be able to make them more trauma informed. So one of the guy and some of these guidelines are written in a way that you would never write them. I mean, we purposely sort of um, weren't weren't trying to write a really good starting point. Um, so a guideline might be be present and participate, but um, this is gonna be challenging for people dealing with dissociating maybe, and it might be challenging for people who have issues with self-esteem. Um, for some people, being present 
um, the most they might be able to do is set their phone aside. Um, and if you're looking at uh, an online platform, does being present mean that you can always see your face? Are people, you know, is their ability to shut the screen down because being present is a, in a whole different way now. But when we looked at that, we thought if the guideline was participate at your own comfort level, um, that that seemed more trauma informed and more possible for people who might be having some of those trauma responses. Um, do you guys, does anyone have other suggestions um, for what um, a guideline around this might be? So, okay. Yeah, so just looking at it, um, and, and hoping that, you know, we want the guideline not to um, make it impossible for a person to, to feel like they can be a part of the group. Um, and then we had one um, show up on time, which is, again, not how we would have worded it, but often there will be something in the guideline about time because that's how groups run. Um, the thing about time in groups well, the thing about time and trauma is they aren't very good partners. Um, I, I think that trauma informs so much of a person's life that making it to a group or an appointment on time can be really challenging sometimes. And I think um, that setting that expectation might, might just not, not be in the best, um, it might not be the best way to approach that with them. Um, sometimes people have to come late, come late because of bus schedules, childcare, a lot of things that are beyond their control. Um, but again, I also, from the facilitator point of view, I also understand it's hard to have a person walk in late to group. So one of the things that, that we do, um, started doing is we plan an activity or something, um, missable, I guess, for a bit, lack of a better word, for the first 15 minutes. So maybe we're making some of the breathing frames and people who come late, I might have some bags and I might give them the stuff and they can make it at home later. And then we maybe start to check in 15 minutes into the group instead of starting it right on the hour. And that way, um, there's a little time built in that gives people some leeway. Um, we always end on time. Uh, because again, people can have buses, childcare, it could impact their ability to get home on time, could impact um, what they have to pay, they might be late for work. And so we always, always end on time. Um, and so Lori and I thought maybe a better um, way to put this would be facilitators will start an in-group on time. So that's my commitment that come nine o'clock or whatever it is, um, who's ever there, we're going to have something to start with. But it also um, is going to be that 15 minutes or so of um, something that if you come late, you haven't missed check-in, you're still going to get in on the, the really um, meaty parts of the group, I guess. Oops. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Give it away. Sorry. Think it back. Okay. Sorry. And then we had um, check your anger, which again is not really a guideline we'd probably write, but there were there are oftentimes you do have things in guidelines about that. Um, and, um, you know, anger can be a positive thing. We've talked about that. We've talked about trying to balance being heard with having it take over the whole group. Um, and, but it's also really important to have something um, about hate language, at least at the why it is for us. We always have something about that. And so um, the, we thought if strong emotions are normal and expected, violence and hate language are not okay. And so, um, and again, you may have lots better ways to um, form these different guidelines, but the idea behind it is just to look at it and see if your guideline might be 
um, keeping someone from group because of a trauma response that would make it impossible for them to attend. If someone says, I can't check my anger, I, I can't say I'm not going to get angry in group, so they don't come, that's not, you know, good. Or if the whole group, that's what they're worried about. And so being able to express those things in a safe way. I think especially since this one came up so much as the kind of the most challenging emotion that comes up with it. Again, having it in the guidelines is such a great way when it does get heated of, you know, it can be like, I'm going to take a pause for just a bit because I know we've got the agreements, you know, we've got the guidelines that we go to every week. Um, and just referring back to those can really can sometimes, you know, just interrupt it and help kind of bring folks back sort of the grounding that Kay was talking about bringing you back to um, a spot. And then again, maybe it's even asking the group, do you want to do a little shift here just to do a, a grounding exercise to move forward? Again, I always ask because it gets one, that's one more opportunity for giving consent, but um, referring back to the guidelines is a great way to. Yeah, and going back a minute to the one on time too, you may want to, the group may want to decide, um, is it okay if someone comes the last five minutes, is that still okay? Or after 30 minutes, is it, this is group today and people don't walk in. Um, they, may, they may want to have a voice in that in order for the group as a whole to feel safe with what's going on. So you can give some leeway, but there could still be boundaries around that time, um, depending on what the group wants. So part of it is, um, and with all of these, I mean, it's negotiating with the group and being able to craft the message in a way that creates the guideline, but doesn't create a barrier. Oh, Lori. Sorry, that was me. Um, turn cell phones, phones off. And so, um, you know, ideally that would be really great because it would be nice for, for the members to be able to disconnect from their phones for an hour. But uh, particularly if a person is experiencing fear, uh, being able to dial 911 in a second might be the thing that keeps them safe. Maybe they didn't have their phone when they were assaulted. And so having a phone on and close is important now. Um, we, there are a lot of people in the world that are caregivers and have to have their phone on, kids in school. And so there's a much more um, um, survivor oriented policy to have them on and just have them on vibrate. And the one thing I will say that I wouldn't think you'd have to say, but it's happened, is to remind people if they have to take a call to please step outside the room. Because I have had people try to have a conversation on their phone in the middle of group. And so um, now I'm really careful about that guideline and specific about, you know, if you have to take an emergency call, you need to get behind the door because it was very odd and unsettling at the time. And um, that's, that's really how we learn about making guidelines <laughs> is some of those experiences. Um, so yeah, cell phones can be on and vibrate. And, you know, or you may have the one group in the world one time that everybody can shut them off and chooses to. And that's fine too, if that's, if that's what the group wants. But um, again, creating safety and you don't want someone who can't have their phone on. And so the whole time they're worried that they're missing a call uh, for their mom who's with a caregiver that day and, or someone is covering for them. So. And then uh, come to group sober. So we do have a guideline. Um, you know, we do have an expectation that people come to our groups clean and sober, but um, we also, you know, that's a, it's a week by week thing. If someone can't come sober this week, we really want them to come back next week. And um, we understand it's a coping mechanism for some people and we understand that it doesn't always work out to come sober. And so we really want to take the judgment away from that and take the barrier away from coming next time when, they, when they're able to do that and able to attend where they can be fully with us. 
All right. I think that's all for that. Do we have any, let's take a pause and see if we have any questions here. No? All right. If they can't come sober one week, do you ask them to go home or can they stay? Um, if, if, so you're saying if they arrive at group and they're not sober, I think. Yeah. Do you want to take this one, Lori? Because yeah. you have such a nice way of, of putting things on the spot. If you're noticing, I mean, if it's noticeable to folks, obviously, then um, then I absolutely would. And the other thing that I think about with this is we've, and we've had this before of offering to send someone in a cab. So that's where it's great with another facilitator to step out and say, We're, I'm really glad you're here. And, you know, part of it was because whatever they were under the influence of, it was a disruption to the group. So it was impacting their, how they normally engaged. And so it was both, you know, we just took a, took a break as a group, but then I was able to talk with the individual and say, you know, I have no idea, your behavior is pretty different than it normally is. So I'm not asking, um, I'm not making an assumption here, but your behavior is really different. And I know we've got the, the policy about not coming under the influence. And she had made a comment that she, was or she had taken some pills. And so with that, it was, can we arrange for a cab? And I'm happy to arrange for a cab to bring you back for your car tomorrow too. But um, that one was, again, it's like making sure there's no shame. It's not like, ah, uh, she's drunk, she's gotta leave. It's like, I really want people to be healthy and safe. And um, so supporting her to be in that spot. I don't know if I answered that. Um, well, it's it's not easy, I will say. It was really tough, and we also wanted to make sure, gosh, did they go in there? You know, were they insisting on going in their car? Could we get a cab for them? And making sure we had that availability. But yes, if it's, if it's noticeable, someone may have had something to drink, and they may show up for a group, and I wouldn't know it. Um, but we're talking if it's, if their behavior is really impacted, yes. Good question, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? And it's about 10 till K, so we should I think do the okay. should do the grounding. Okay. All right. So we've talked a lot about grounding. Uh, and so we're gonna do a grounding exercise together. Um, and this is one that I borrowed from um, the YWCA in Portland. I went to a training there and did it and I really liked it. And the reason I like it is because it has the four different or four different types of grounding in it. So again with grounding you want to uh, put your feet flat on the floor and you want to keep your eyes open because this is a chance to come into the room um, rather than to go somewhere else. And if it's easier to, if your face is on um, the little thumbnails and it's easier to stop your video to do this. If that feels more relaxing, go ahead and do that. Just, this will just take a couple minutes and then we'll come back. All right, so maybe a deep breath first. It's been a lot of information. All right, here we go. You're going to begin a grounding exercise. I would like you to think of all the stress and anxiety you've been feeling. Recall all of the negative emotions that have come up for you. And I'd like you to choose a number from one to five that represents how much stress and anxiety you feel at this moment. I want you to remember this number and we'll see if it changes after the grounding exercise. Now gather up all of those emotions, everything that is causing you stress or anxiety and find a container of some kind. Maybe it's a jar with a lid, maybe it's a box. Something secure that you could put it in and close the top. Put everything into the container 
and now you're going to release it. Maybe you're going to throw it in the ocean or throw it so far away you can no longer see it. Watch it disappear. Now we're going to practice some mental grounding. Without speaking, I want you to look around the room. Name five objects in the room. Notice how many doors there are. How many windows? Notice the color of the walls. Notice the color of the carpet or floor. Now think of the number 100. Now in your mind, subtract five. Subtract five again. And subtract five again. It's not about the number. Remember to keep your eyes open. Now think of the number 40. Now think of half of that. Now think of half of that again. Now we'll practice physical grounding. Make sure your feet are planted on the ground and press your heels into the floor. Notice how it feels. Feel your chair, notice its texture. Is it soft or hard? Is it cool or warm? Now touch a piece of your clothing. Notice if it's smooth. Is it warmer or cooler than the chair? Now choose another object to touch. Notice its temperature. Notice its texture. Now we're going to practice soothing grounding. Think of a place where you felt calm, safe, and peaceful. If you can't think of a place, you can think of this room because this is a safe place. Remember everything about it while keeping your eyes open. Think about where it is. What time of day is it? Are you alone or is someone with you? Look at every detail. What is calming about this place? Notice the temperature. Think of the way it smells. Now think of the face of someone you care about. Picture them smiling at you. And now think of your number, the number that represents the negative feelings you have. And just notice if it's gone down at all, or if it's gone up, or if it stayed the same. So that's just one grounding exercise. I'm sure you guys have lots of them um, that you share and you know you can Google grounding and there's lots more. But that's one of our favorites um, that we use here. Thank you, Kay. And I realize just in the interest of time, so we've got just a few minutes left. Um, happy to take questions. I can rattle off more grounding exercises if you want, but I um, I also want to give you all a moment to pause because everyone's been really present for this last hour and a half. Uh, what virtual platform are you using for your groups? So with the, oh, that's a great question on the Latina group. Um, they've done it just on a phone one and I don't know off the top of my head, I'm going to have to check on that one. Um, we've done Zoom for a parents group. So those are the, the two, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to, uh, to check to find out what the phone was, one was that Irma is using. And then will there be more webinars around these topics? Um, I know there is the, the Circle of Hope that has um, a lot through Wix app about, the, um, about groups. There are several Kay and I have done a couple of different ones on groups. I don't know it's been specifically, we were trying not to duplicate information that we had done in some of the earlier ones, but I believe those are recorded. 
and I'm not trying to do that as a shameless plug. I just can't remember. It was a while ago that we did those, but um, I would encourage you to check out the Wixap library there. And hopefully someday we'll be able to do the in-person when we do on support group co-facilitation because that's just a joy to do and it gives people a chance to practice some of the really challenging situations. Yeah, and I think WICSAP is always happy to hear suggestions of things that, um, they seem really receptive to suggestions of things that would be helpful. Here's one that I recently learned I'll just share. Someone from a group said they keep an orange in the freezer and um, because they used to do an ice cube to try and sort of bring them back to grounding, but of course that got wet and messy. And then when they had an orange in the freezer, it was a, um, not only the cold that brought them back and the texture of it, but the scent of it. I had not heard that one, but I thought that was a, a lovely idea for grounding. Oh. Nothing else? I'm just so grateful for you all for your time. And again, for the fact that you care this much. Yes, you do rock. And what you know in advocacy, you bring forward into facilitation. Um, we are more than happy to share information. I will say Kay is always quicker at responding than I am, but um, that's just, you know, tech thing there but any way we can help or support uh, please let us know because we think support groups are amazing so, thank you so much and thank you except carolina and michelle thank you so much and for the captioners i really appreciate that yes well thank you everyone for attending and thank you kay thank you Lori. Uh, the slides and the recording will be available uh, probably later this week. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. What I didn't realize to, oh, it's still being recorded there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay.